as Jamal was speaking, I, uh, actually, I think it was actually with Lavana's introduction and then as Jamal was speaking, um, Lavana's exactly right. We do a lot of work in the building across the way that, um, you know, gets attention and, you know, we think it's very important and uh, we, um, you know, we hope to improve uh, uh, health in general and disparities more specifically. Um, but we don't make the bridge. We don't really make the connection from what we do um, at the Schaefer Center uh, as often as we should, or as deeply as I think we probably could, um, to communities here like Lavana is, is, um, is setting up. And so uh, my light bulb moment is just I'm awfully glad to be here, and I'm gl really glad to have this opportunity. Um, that having been said, I'm not sure you guys are going to be so happy <laughs> to see what I have to present, because it's pretty technical. Um, but anyway, you'll see, and maybe we can think together about sort of what the bridge looks like afterwards. Um, so um, my name is Karen Van Nuys. I work at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics in the building next door. Um, I'm going to tell you about some research that we've recently published in the Journal uh, of the American College of Cardiology on uh, innovation in heart failure treatment and its impact on life expectancy, disability, and health disparities. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the Schaefer Center, some of the work we do there, how we do it, and so on. Again, all in the interest of thinking about um, how a bridge might, uh, might be constructed. Um, so the Schaefer Center was established in 2009. It's a unique collaboration between the policy school here, Price, and the pharmacy school at USC. It, um, it also has a sort of collaboration USC-wide and even beyond USC. Uh, we have roughly 40 faculty who are affiliated with the Schaefer Center from all kinds of different disciplines, including economics, a lot of economists, but also uh, doctors and epidemiologists and lawyers and uh, from all, all kinds of different disciplines, pharmacy and so on. Um, we, uh, let's see. Just, just to uh, toot our own horn a little bit, um, the US News and World Report uh, magazine came out with its rankings this year, and um, the, they ranked us third in, for health policy and management uh, schools in the, in the country. And if you actually um, uh, uh, combine these rankings with our football scores, we're number one. <laughs> so. Um, we do a lot of different kinds of work at the Schaefer Center, um, but all of them fall under one of these four themes. All of the work we do falls under one of these four themes, through these sort of strategic areas. Uh, improving the performance of healthcare markets, increasing value in healthcare delivery, fostering better pharmaceutical policy and global regulation, and improving health and reducing disparities throughout the lifespan. And the work that I'm going to tell you about a little bit later is really sort of focused on that fourth, um, that fourth category of improving health and reducing disparities. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, publications and research are sort of um, the core of what any academic institution does, and they are certainly the heart of what we uh, what we do at the Schaefer Center. Um, our um, our uh, faculty publish on a wide range of topics, ranging from you know the burden of Alzheimer's disease to Medicare policy to the opioid crisis to early childhood education and so on. This very broad sort of scope. Um, the unifying theme here, though, is that all of our research is evidence-based, it's policy-oriented, and it's targeted toward improving value in healthcare. Um, two years ago, we began a novel partnership with the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. This has been a real success for us. We, um, this, this partnership gives us um, access to some of the policy expertise that lives at the, at the Brookings Center in Washington. It also gives us a platform to get more of our research in front of policymakers in Washington. We've hosted several events uh, at the Brookings Center in Washington where we present Schaefer research uh, in front of a conference or a, a, um, an audience of policymakers, policy influencers, Washington media, and so on. So that's been um, another element of what we've been doing over at Schaefer. 
Schaefer has all kinds of resources to support the kind of research that we do. We've got terabytes of health data and computing resources and statisticians and programmers and all kinds of things. A really key resource for a lot of what we do lives in this uh, center called the Roybal Center for Health Policy Simulation, and this is um, important for the work I'll be telling you about too uh, in a little bit. Um, the Roybal Center was launched in 2004 with a grant from the National Institutes on Aging, um, and uh, they build and maintain and sort of control several microsimulation models um, that we use in our research. One in particular has the horrible name of the future elderly model, um, but that just seems to be the name it's gotten over time. Um, but we also refer to it as the FEM so that we don't have to say future elderly so much. Um, and this model in particular, it's a demographic uh, and economic microsimulation of the U.S older population, age 50 and above. Um, and what the model enables us to do is to ask questions and explore questions like what would happen if a particular policy change were made or some other kind of experiment, thought experiment. You could sort of run these thought experiments and then simulate out what it would look like, what the, what the economy would look like under these different thought experiments. And so um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the FEM in a minute. Um, we've, uh, our, our um, researchers have published, I think it's now, the count is 67 papers using the FEM thus far in academic journals on all kinds of topics. You can see some of them there. Um, obesity, cost of dementia, price controls, Medicare reform, and so on. The, the, the list goes on and on of the kinds of things we can do and have done with the FEM. Um, most recently, a couple of years ago, we began a program to um, expand the FEM to other countries. And so um, at the current count is we have 15 different countries where we've basically taken the structure of the model uh, and collaborating with researchers in other countries used their data from their local countries to populate it so that they could run similar experiments and, and you know sort of questions on their own um, on their own country dynamics and so I think we you know countries like Japan and Korea and Germany and uh, Italy and Mexico and uh, 15 in total and we've got two that are being built but aren't finished yet uh, one in Taiwan and one for Kenya Okay, not to geek out on you too much, but I am going to have to run you through a little bit of the technique just so that you can um, uh, uh, see what we, what we do in, the, in what follows. Okay, so the future elderly model is a microsimulation model that's based on, uh, based on data from a lot of different sources, but a really important one is the Health and Retirement Study, which was launched in 1990 by the National Institutes on Aging. It is a two-year survey of, I think it's 20,000 older individuals, age 50 and above, in the US. They go out, and it's a longitudinal survey, so every two years they go out and they interview these same people um, to find out sort of what's going on with them and by what's going on in all kinds of different dimensions. So their health, their health care, their insurance coverage, their economic situation, their social security situation, their living situation, situations and so on and so forth. So it's a very detailed um, uh, study of older Americans. Um, and what we do with the future elderly model is we use those data to, um, uh, to sort of populate our model and, and kind of parameterize it, if you will. Um, so we begin with uh, the American population age 51 and above in some starting year, let's say 2016. So we look at that population and we can take a snapshot of what they look like. And so we know things about the health and economic outcomes of that population in 2016. So this is, you know, what proportion of them have been diagnosed with diabetes? What proportion of them are working? What proportion of them are are claiming disability insurance, what, what proportion of them are claiming social security, and so on and so forth. So all kinds of different outcomes that we can look at. Um, and then, using the model, we basically simulate the aging of that population 51 and older by two years. And we do that using data from the health and retirement study, where we can actually take somebody 
in one wave of the, or take, take the data in one wave of the HRS, look at how it changes over a two year period and turn that into what are called transition probabilities. And we take those transition probabilities, we apply them to the population age 51 and we basically artificially age them by two years. Um, so we can tell, say for example, we're looking at you know, the set of individuals who are you know, 60 year old white female non-smokers employed who have diabetes. And then we can look at the HRS data with that subset of the population, look at them in one wave and then look at them two years later, and then we know sort of the probability that, for example, they'll be diagnosed with cancer, the probability that they'll retire, the probability that they'll begin smoking, the and so on and so forth. So we can sort of play all of that out. Okay, so we age these folks, and so when we age them by two years, we're gonna have a population in 2018, but it's gonna be the population that is aged 53 and older, right? Because we start with 51 and 216. So we have to add in some additional folks who turn 51 and 52 in the ensuing years, and then we wind up with the simulated population that's age 51 in 2018. That population, we collect the same kind of health and economic outcomes. And so if you look at the orange box, and we just basically rinse and repeat, we just do it over and over again uh, as long as we want to. And by looking at sort of what we store in those orange boxes over time, you get a picture of what the world will look like in terms of health outcomes and economic outcomes in the future. So that's how the simulation works. Okay, so um, with co-authors Mark Latke at Stanford and Dana Goldman, Brian Heisinger, and Richard Shea here at the Schaefer Center, uh, we just published this paper in uh, JACC Heart Failure uh, on the innovation on innovation heart failure treatment, life expectancy disabilities, and health disparities. Um, the work was supported by grants from the National Institute on Aging, as well as Novartis. Um, okay. So um, we were uh, sort of motivated by a few things. One of them is just the fact that healthcare is taking up an increasing share of our national resources, both in terms of GDP, also as a proportion of public spending, healthcare is crowding out other kinds of spending. And as an economist, we look at that, you know, it's 17.5% of GDP in I think 2014. And as an economist, you look at that number, that's a big number, that's a lot of money, is that, is that worrisome? You have to ask, well, what are we getting in return? Right, any smart shopper would ask that. Um, well, it turns out that, and this is not work we did, but this is uh, um, uh, from a paper by Ma et al. in JAMA 2015. It turns out at least one of the things that we appear to be getting by spending that money is reduced mortality. And this is mortality for the entire US population, age standardized uh, from all causes, okay? Um, so that seems like a good thing. What's more, and this is again data from the Ma um, uh, paper, um, that uh, reduced mortality is driven at least in part by reductions in mortality from heart disease. Um, and so the, the dark line at the top are, is mortality from heart disease, the middle line, the sort of tan line is cancer, and the lower line is stroke. Um, and on the left is male and on the, on the right is female. So you can see that in, definitely in heart disease and to a lesser extent in stroke, we see decreasing mortality over this time period. Cancer, maybe it's decreasing a little bit, but certainly compared to heart, uh, heart disease, uh, progress has been less encouraging in cancer. So for all that money we're spending, we're seeing reduced, uh, reduced mortality rates. But, and this is data from, um, we just downloaded this from the CDC Wonder database. You can go out and get it too. Um, this is age-adjusted mortality rates from heart failure, so one of the big uh, elements of the heart disease category. Um, and this progress appears to have been leveling off. So if you look at it, and these are broken out by um, race and gender uh, subcategories, you can see that from you know, 1998 until about 2011, a, a decline, maybe not a, an impressive decline, but a, a slow, reasonably steady decline. And then something weird happens in 2011. It looks as though the mortality rate from heart failure has begun to increase again. We don't have very good explanations for this, as far as I know. Um, but in, in addition to that, um, that observation, you can also see that the difference in heart uh, in mortality rates from heart failure appear to be widening across those different categories. So we're seeing potentially an increase in disparities here. Um, so just a little bit about heart failure for those of you who don't, who don't know about it. It's actually a very serious disease. 
It is um, widely prevalent. One in five Americans will experience heart failure at some point in their lives. It is um, very deadly. One in nine U.S. deaths uh, lists heart failure as a contributing factor. One in nine. Um, and it is very costly, as you might imagine. Uh, and it is also a disabling disease. I'll show you some data on that in a minute, too. Um, that is, um, but one of the, um, the first things that we've done uh, with this research is to just sort of document the in, that there is an increase, not only in historical data, there we go. So this is just, we're plotting out the, the, uh, the prevalence of heart failure in the HRS is increasing. Uh, this is up until, I think it's 2012. And then we went ahead and simulated out this prevalence using the FEM. Um, and you see that it's rising, and it's, we're going to estimate it's about 8% uh, in 2030. Um, so an increasing trend. Our, our estimates are a little higher than historical estimates have. That has to do with the way the FEM works. We think they're more accurate. OK. Um, and um, what is, is reasonably well known is that there are differ differential impacts by these uh, different subpopulations by, uh, by race and by gender. So this on the left-hand panel is the lifetime risk of heart failure from uh, um, ages 45 to 75. This comes from the ERIC study. This is not our work. Um, but male and fe African, these are African-American male and females. And you'll see almost one in four. African-American females in this age range uh, it ha will experience heart failure. Um, and then compared to white populations, it's, um, it's much higher. Um, we went ahead and replicated this just using the HRS data. Ours is annual risk of heart failure among patients with heart disease. So the, the vertical scales are different, but the story is the same. Uh, disparities um, across races, and which seem to be uh, greater uh, for women. This slide takes a little bit of setup. OK, so we look at the data from the HRS in 2010 and 2012, so two, two uh, sequential waves of the HRS data. And we ask, first of all, we identify everybody who is diagnosed for the first time with heart failure in 2012 in the second wave. Okay, And we ask of them how many are reporting limitations in three or more activities of daily living. Activities of daily living are basic tasks required to sort of live independently. So they're things like dressing yourself, bathing yourself, eating yourself, getting out of bed, getting around the house, using the restroom, and so on. So there, if people are reporting three or more, limitations in three or more of these activities, it's a reasonably significant degree of disability. It's starting to indicate that it may be difficult for individuals to live independently or without help at home. OK, so we ask individuals, um, we identify individuals who are going to be diagnosed with heart failure in 2012, but we go back and we look at history and we ask about how many activities of daily living uh, were they having trouble with in 2010, which is the period before they're diagnosed. OK, and the population as, whole, as a whole, 10% of folks are reporting this level of disability before diagnosis. OK, so it's a, you know, it's not a, not a, 10% is kind of a high number for this level of disability, okay? But that 10% is not distributed equally across these different race and, uh, and gender classes. In particular, um, and this is before diagnosis, you can see African American white males and white females look about the same. The rate is about 7 to 9%. Um, among those three classes, African American women, one in five, is reporting this level of disability before diagnosis with congestive heart failure. Okay? Now, we roll then forward to the next wave of the HRS and we ask the same question, but asking it now that they've been diagnosed with congestive heart failure. As a group, disability almost doubles in this group, but again, not distributed equally across all groups. And so now you see that whereas prior to diagnosis, African-American males looked about the same as, as, as white males or white females, they don't anymore. So congestive heart failure, um, it, first, it, it, it is a disabling condition and it is differentially disabling. It increases disparities. The diagnosis with heart failure increases disparities across these classes. So um, 
So now's when we bring in the simulation model, okay? So we wanted to understand what would be the impact if there were a cure for heart failure. Economists do this all the time. The FEM is built to do this, okay? And, you know, asking about cures for all kinds of diseases. So, but we wanted to look at it compared to different diseases. So what we did in the model was basically ran the simulation one time through baseline just to see what health was going to look like you know, um, without any intervention. And then we ran it through seven other times, and each of those seven other times we turned off a disease, one of which was heart failure, but then we also, in subsequent, uh, in subsequent rounds, we turned off cancer, we turned off lung, lung disease, and so on and so forth, and then compared the, uh, the implications. So these are um, life expectancies, gains in life expectancies when you compare that scenario where we turn off a disease to one where we just run the baseline without turning anything off, okay? And this is what it looks like. Heart failure is in yellow. The other diseases that we looked at uh, are in gray. And you can see, this is how you read this chart, heart failure, if, if we were to cure heart failure, we could expect on average a 1.9 years of additional life expectancy for everybody who was otherwise going to get heart failure, for everybody who was, uh, who was affected by the, by the change. Um, and that compares with, you know, it's about the same for diabetes. It's much higher than for high blood pressure. And by the way, this model takes into account the, the knock-on effect. So turning off high blood pressure then, then improves people's diagnoses that are related to high blood pressure too, when, where high blood pressure is a risk factor. Um, and the only two diseases in our simulation uh, that, are, that sort of generate greater impact are lung disease and cancer. Um, so, but as you might suspect now, you know where I'm going with this, right? 1.9 years, but uh, that 1.9 years is not distributed equally across the different demographic groups that we were talking about. And in particular, um, what you see is that the life expectancy gains from eliminating heart failure are greater for African American women than for white women, and for African American men than for white men. It makes sense, right? If the disease is disproportionately impacting African Americans, um, it makes sense that curing it would sort of have the opposite effect. Um, and so here we're talking about, among women, the difference is about four months of additional life expectancy, and for men it's about it's a little more than two months. Okay, so the point being that a cure for heart failure could help to close those gaps. Okay. Um, now, because I'm an economist, that means I'm good at multiplication, and no economist can resist multiplying out a per person effect times the total population. So we did that, total life years gained, so we're multiplying that 1.9 life years uh, times the number of people who would get it, and it's 2.7 million life years, that's a big number, economists love big numbers. Total disability free life years gained is 1.1 million. Um, so these are just years with no disability, no, no uh, limitations in ADLs. Um, and then again, um, as, as we know, some audiences respond to dollar figures and economists are big on dollar figures. And so w depending on how much you, you value a life year, these, uh, these gains are on the order of 160 to $400 billion. It's not the $1.24 trillion that Jamal showed us before, so I, I, I'm not going to win that race, but it's a big number nevertheless. So thank you.